Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Vienna Humanities Festival uh, and to this talk. In the next 60 minutes, we'll be discussing the Velvet Revolution. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you the Slovak sociologist, writer, university professor, and diplomat, Martin Butura, who just came by train from Bratislava in order to join um, our festival. Martin Butura is currently uh, advisor to the President of the Slovak Republic, Andrei Kiska, and he also serves as a honorary president of the Slovak Institute for Public Affairs, which he co-founded 20 years ago. In November 89, Mr. Butura was one of the founders of the political movement Public Against Violence, and he was one of the people who drafted the election program uh, of the movement. In the period 1990-1992, he held the position of human rights advisor to president of the Czech and Slovak Federal Republic, Václav Havel, and he held the post of director of the human rights section in the office of President Havel. The numerous writings and public appearances, speeches of Mr. Butura are mostly concentrated on analyzing the socio-political realities of transition in Central and Eastern Europe. So, um, as you see, as a guest, we have someone who not only has the analytical knowledge to talk about the Velvet Revolution, but somebody who has actually lived this revolution in very, its very center. Martin Butera, welcome to the Humanities Festival. Nessie, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming instead of enjoying the nice Saturday and walking and... and Con very conveniently, it's not that nice anymore yeah. <laughs> outside. So, but you have lived the revolution. Um, you were there, uh, you were active in the... You lived socialism before that. So my first question would be, I really would like to ask you to start with describing the mood and the expectations that the very days of 89 brought. Yeah. Well, uh, I think practically in all countries in the Soviet bloc, there was a general feeling and a lot of proofs that the current regime, given regime, simply doesn't work efficiently, that it doesn't deliver, and it is lacking behind the more advanced countries, neighbors, and also countries in the West. Uh, in many of those regimes, uh, members of the Soviet bloc, there has been a very special phenomenon. There was an unwritten and tacit social contract, so-called social contract, between the rulers and the population, which practically said, you, as an inhabitant, it's a better expression than as a citizen, you simply won't be involved and engaged politically, and you won't criticize anything what is combined with the way how we perform. And uh, as an exchange, we will give you social benefits, social security, unemployment, uh, subsidized housing, cheap beer, and many other benefits. This social contract in, in uh, late, 90, late 70s, half of 80s practically gradually uh, was not able to function more. Then there were external factors, I just named them. Gorbachev, Helsinki Accord, Pope, uh, Reagan. So something was on the move, the Helsinki Accord created possibility for small circles of dissent simply to say, well, your gov our government has signed it, so we should we should keep with, with, with the documents and with the rules. In case of Czechoslovakia, there was a slightly different situation in the Slovak part of the state and of the Czech part of the state. While for the Czechs, it was an evident and detailed and frequently described civilization decline. Uh, please remember we had this First Republic, Masaryk Republic, which was an island of democracy in the pre-Second World War Europe. Czechoslovakia at that time, especially with Czech industry, was very well developed. 
it performed quite well. And from this, all of a sudden, we have appeared somewhere on the margin. There was a different situation in Slovakia because of the character of modernization, unlike in the Czech parts, where modernization take, uh, took, her, uh, took place uh, under capitalist condition. In Slovakia, as for instance in several other countries of the Soviet bloc, uh, it was conducted uh, during the socialism period. It means it was a modernization which on the one hand has brought an evident progress, urbanization, industrialization, and I could go on and on. On the other hand, all that was conducted at the expense of human rights. So in Slovakia, to simplify a bit, the public mood was rather oriented uh, to something like perestroika. It means some small changes in the, uh, maybe in the economy, but, but not a really uh, revolutionary breakthrough. We know it from, from the service, my wife Zora Butelova, a sociologist, she's here, so we, we did it for 25 years regularly and repeated service about how people perceived the situation before, and this was the case. And then it came. Could I talk a bit about it? I think uh, in case of my country, we were horribly ashamed because it looked like we will be the last. It was not only the reburial of Imre Nagy in Hungary, not only the establishment of first political parties in Hungary, it was not only that the solidarity won the elections in Polish Senate, 99 from 100 seats. So, and even, and even East Germans, which were perceived as the most, I would say, democratically underdeveloped society, all of a sudden, the Berlin Wall falls. So Czechoslovakia was the last example, and there was really a feeling, the atmosphere, something must happen. Interestingly enough, there was an interview with Madeleine Albright five days before the revolution, and she said, well, in Prague they are still arresting, they are still beating. It was before the Prague brutal suppression of student demonstrations. So we cannot expect anything special, maybe the next year, maybe the summer next year. The opposite has become the true. All of a sudden, after the brutal suppression of, uh, uh, of student demonstration called on 17th November, uh, in both parts of the state it has started. And I have to tell you, it was a fascinating experience. It means that uh, the next, and it was simultaneously conducted both in Prague and Bratislava and later in other cities. It means that one day after the news and reports about this brutal suppression and about, this was not true, but that was a, that was the rumor, that was the news about the killing of one of the students. So people who usually knew each other in Slovakia, knew each other as uh, environmentalists, as writers, as artists, as musicians, as uh, members of certain civic descent, or as Christians being involved in secret church, but, but but not meeting at, at a, I would say, the opposition political activities, all of them gathered in, in a building, Umelecka Beseda, it means the, the old house for the artists, and 500 of those people who usually um, were uh, somehow accustomed to me that, uh, you know, artistic uh, events and, and concerts and theaters and so on, they knew that now they have met purely on political reasons. The next day, the public against violence was established. It was the child of revolution because uh, what we saw in the first days was that those so-called islands of positive deviance, which were created by those independently thinking and independently acting people, were somehow gathered and created an archipelago. And then it went in an incredible speed. We almost didn't sleep sleep uh, for the first seven days. In the third day after it, together with students, there, there was a small demonstration then big, on the biggest square in Slovakia. More than 50,000 people came there. It was the first meeting. On the second meeting, Alexander Dubček came. He then came in Prague. And one week after uh, the establishment of public against violence, again, at the same time, like Civic Forum in Prague, we communicated with them. This unfamous Article 4 about the ruling 
ruling role, leading role of Communist Party was abolished. So in one week, we saw the end and change of regime, I mean, on a political level. It, it was really something, it was necessary, f final sentence, it was, there was necessary certain dramaturgy on those meetings. So we, at that time, we were in the period of searching for allies. We invited various people, workers, uh, regular people, <laughs> I would say also some celebrities, and so on and so on, and gradually they created an impression that simply the regime either will use the China mechanism, you remember what has become in China, or they simply will start to negotiate. At the beginning, it was only about dialogue, but in four or five days, it was about the change of the regime. This was actually my question. So what were the hopes that were put on this revolution in the early days of the revolution itself? I think the early days were, first of all, about expressing, publicly expressing the deep dissatisfaction with the way how the regime has performed because, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this fact that the, demonst that the student demonstration which was allowed on 17th of November, 17th of November was the commemoration of the closing of Czech high, uni high uh, school, high, in high education institutions, yes? So the Nazis, when they occupied Czech, Czech part of the state, non-existing state, on 17th November, they closed all universities. And during the communist era, there were regular commemorations of it. Now, something like this was allowed. The authorities were a bit afraid. They knew that it might change, and it has changed. And it was brutally suppressed with a lot of blood, with several dozens of people uh, really, really being uh, brutally suppressed. The, and then in various environments, in the universities, in schools, in theaters, the strike has begun. At the beginning, it was first of all protest against this, and secondly, let's have a dialogue with the, with the public authorities, with the rulers. This is, uh, it cannot continue like this. Uh, I remember on um, Monday, 20th, we prepared the first declaration of this public against violence, and the last sentence of it, which later has appeared as an electrifying sentence, electrifying motive was, let us as citizens take our own issues in our hands. And it practically generated the creation, but creation in hours, in days, of uh, those similar branches of this public environment in the whole of Slovakia. But again, the, uh, the, the question of the substantial and deep and total regime change, it means the end of that sort of so real socialism which we had came only on the fourth or fifth day. Fifth day. And what about the ideals of liberal democracy, market economy, when this came on top of the agenda? Then, of course, European Union integration. So yeah. how did the transition then evolve from there? Um, I would say, uh, unlike, as I mentioned, in Poland and Hungary, when uh, there was solidarity movement in Poland, there was Charter 77 in Prague, but at that time, uh, at that time, it was uh, a relatively small circle of people. Uh, but the, I would say, the territories of those independently acting people has been broadening, and uh, that was clear that one thing is important: it means free elections. Uh, it is interesting that there was a tradition of the free elections during the pre-war Czechoslovakia, and to a certain extent, even in the period between 1945 and 1948. So uh, there wasn't such a, you know, a, a century uh, pause. It was practically not such a long period, so people could return to those ideas, and this was, I would say, part of it. Uh, the situation in Czechoslovakia was complicated because uh, uh, and in Slovakia, at least, because at least of three or four reasons. Uh, the challenges, the tasks for those who were first incorporated in both federal parliament, Slovak parliament, and Czech parliament, and then 
who were elected in the first three elections in June 1990, uh, there were three tasks. So the first was obviously uh, the political one. It means change for a normal, standard, regular democratic regimes. It is easy to say, it takes time to establish, but anyway. Then there was a, the need for economic reforms because, as I said, economy was lagging behind. And then, in case of Czechoslovakia, what was very important was to find a constitutional arrangement to negotiate, uh, uh, I would say, a commonly agreed vision, commonly agreed pragmatic uh, solution about, about between the Czechs and the Slovaks, between Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic in the common state. And in June 1990, the new ruling representatives were elected only for two years. So imagine, in two years, they were commissioned to somehow achieve all three of those goals. I can say also with the, with the passing of the, of the list of human rights that on the political level it, it went quite well. There was also some, uh, some first um, steps in the economic reform, but uh, the, it was not possible to achieve agreements. We had three parliaments, federal, Czech and Slovak, three governments, Czech, federal, Slovak. We had President Havel, and then we have at least two or three ruling movements. And there were a series of negotiations between all of them, how, especially, especially, and key question was how to arrange the, the future relationship between the Czech and Slovak part of the state, and in this we have failed. In, in Slovakia, uh, it was not so easy to agree on economic reforms because, as I said, we had this tradition of socialist modernization, full, un full employment, and Czechoslovakia was oriented on the heavy, especially in the military industry. Unfortunately, some of our tanks are still in Syria. Some of the weapons of Slovakia have been smuggled during the horrible days of, of also struggles throughout the world. Uh, now we are producing cars, which is better than tanks, but at the time, and it, it gradually practically um, ceased to function. It ceased to function already in 88 and 89, but then with the changes. So, and this created a, a deep disillusionment, deep criticism. The politicians are just talking, negotiating. This democracy, what is it about? It doesn't function. So, I mean, these were also the first question marks over, over in how far uh, these new regimes, these new pillars, this new democracy will be perceived and received and accepted by the population. But anyway, there was a debate, um, long-lasting debate in, um, among the experts and political scientists and writers and authors, which practically said that, well, those so-called velvet revolutions there wasn't anything new about them. Uh, all the ideas were already known. It was the old standard ideas of uh, pluralistic democracy, checks and balances, and, and so on, and so on, which, to be honest, in the 70s started slightly to evaporate. There was a crisis of capitalism, beyond any doubt, and it was somehow postponed, this crisis, because, because uh, already in the third wave of... of, of um, this democratization, so it means with Portugal and Spain and Latin America, and especially with those fall of the communist regimes, those ideas all of a sudden appeared on the scene and were very popular and, I would say, very, uh, very well received. And, uh, you know, Francois Fouret and the others said that it was practically nothing new. I, I'd like to challenge it a young American historian, James Crapper, wrote a book about revolution with human face. He has been studying thousands of, of letters, of resolutions, of various expressions of people, especially in countryside, in factories, in schools, uh, in, in small villages and, and, and big cities. And, and he has found out that, first of all, all of that was not a hierarchical organization, but it was a very, very deep and very momentous civic involvement. And secondly, the ideas of nonviolence, of human dignity, were expressed there. So Crumpel says that, well, yes, 
uh, there is some difference because unlike the revolutions like French Revolution, this was not a brute revolution, this was the Velvet Revolution and it was something what at the time was new. Uh, if, if I may, for a second, we are in Vienna and Heinburg is not so far. Um, one of the proofs and one of the demonstrations how these those, I would say, ideas of dignity were for people in Slovakia and in Bratislava was the so-called march to Heinburg. It has occurred on December 10, 1989, and the idea was that Let's look at Bratislava from the other side of the Danube. Uh, you should know, please, that for us, this church's concept of Iron Curtain, it was not an intellectual concept. It was visible, humiliating, and seen. We, we were seeing the gods, we were seeing the shooting, and it was like looking on the, at the moon on the other side, on the Austrian side. So. In the first days, it came into my mind it would be nice and it would, it would generate a strong enthusiasm if we could invite people and offer people to go to Heinburg. And uh, then more than 100,000 of inhabitants of Bratislava, it was negotiated with our Ministry of Interior and with Heinburg authorities. They came, most of them by foot, and they were old people, there were mothers with young kids, there were people on bikes and so on and so on. And it was Sunday, Sunday in Austria, it means shops were closed. Uh, and uh, well, this part of Austria at that time looked a bit shabby. It, it wasn't the, uh, I would say, the post where everyone would laugh and admire. And we ask our people not to buy, but to bring a present, a gift for the Austrians. So uh, this was an incredible moment on the other side of, uh, of Devin, uh, Devin, which is this, this castle. Devin Castle, there was a, there was a tr big tricolor in the middle of the river. There was famous singer, there was, uh, who were somehow celebrating it. And, um, and there was a big iron heart which was created by creative artists. So I think it was a very moving demonstration that people came there again, not to admire the Western capitalism, but to enjoy this experience of freedom, of liberty, of everything what was connected with the slogan Ahoy Europe at the time. And just final remark, when President Kiska had his inauguration from, from that time, uh, 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 he, he visited Devin Castle because there is a memorial to those hundreds of people who were shot there. And uh, he takes there each and every state visit. I have to tell you that if you see in 30 meters on the crossroad of Danube and Morava the Austrian border, and if you understand and perceive that this was simply the frontier of two civilizations, so from President Gauck to many men, including obviously Hans Fischer. So this is a vital demonstration of what we have been living at the time. Um, I just want to say that we'll have questions, about 20 minutes for questions, so if you want, you can start thinking of what you would like to ask. But my next question would be, well, soon we'll be marking uh, 28 years of the Velvet Revolution. So looking back, were the democratic ideals of 89 fulfilled? Was the transition a success, or what was the successes, and if there were failures, the failures yeah. of the transition? Well, interestingly enough, and I immediately saw it when I saw the title, Revolutions, even with exclamation. Revolutions is a fascinating, irritating word. You know, Ralph Darendorf, a famous author, has been writing, it is the uh, the period of certain melancholy, uh, where there are hopes and there are desires, and then comes disillusionment. Uh, if uh, in most of these countries these events are celebrated, they are almost always strongly criticized, yes? Mm, those people, general public and experts and media and journalists are saying, well, it, it, it went well, something went wrong and so on. And then obviously the politicians sometimes accuse each other, it was you who 
uh, or your predecessor who simply contributed to it. I don't think, by and large, that it was a failure. I think that the basic rules, basic pillars, basic ground of uh, what one can call a, a standard democracy was established. However, we have democratic institutions, but, they, we, but quite often we do not have democrats in these institutions. We inherited political culture, which was rather oriented at those politicians who are coming with promises and with immediate solutions. Uh, and it will take time until all this will be more deeply enrooted. If we look at the post for Italy, or even Austria, so tw after 20 years after the war, 25 years after the war, we see that it really takes some time until all this is um, somehow more deeply enrooted. At the same time, what we are experiencing now is a more global trend. And this more global trend is an evident decline of liberal democracies, of liberal democratic ideas, according you know, all the service, all the proofs, let it be Freedom House, let it be Transition Index and so on. And we do not have to study the, the, these expert service. We can just look at our neighbors on the north and on the south. Uh, that even, even those, I would say, ideal countries like Poland and Hungary, which were for us the models, the patterns, we admire them very much, are now experiencing very, very, very complicated periods. And uh, I don't think it's only one reason for that all. The famous Polish sociologist Zygmunt Baumann came with this concept of liquid modernity. This principle said that there are no more firm and long-lasting ties and links and relations between people and, and so on. And this liquid modernity was translated into liquid anger in many parts of Central and Eastern Europe, but not only there. And not only that, I think we, are, we have been living during the last three, years, four years in an un, uh, previously simply unexperienced period because there is also, besides those two liquid, uh, liquid um, uh, phenomena, there is also a phenomenon of liquid uncertainty. Look, in the, in the times of Cold War, there was this horrible threat of cataclysm, nuclear cataclysm. But it was known, it was quite visible, and it was one dimension. Now it's not just one dimension. There is economic crisis, migrant crisis, climate change. There is a turmoil in the Middle East. There is a rising Russia. Uh, there is a distrust to mainstream media. There are a synergy of negative developments which created this feeling of liquid uncertainty. And I think that if you are talking about revolutions, so. This is one of the reasons why also these revolutions were challenged, were, were questioned, why we see uh, the, the, the rise of the populists, why we have fascists in Slovak parliament, and why we do not know what will be the result of German elections. I'm not talking about Chancellor Merkel, but if for the first time a party with opinions like Alternative for Deutschland will be in the parliament, this will be something new, even in the most established democratic country. But am I right to think that the disillusionment with the transition is more or less everywhere in Central and Eastern Europe? Well, I myself come from Bulgaria, and on the 25th anniversary of 89, there was a study made how people perceive this 25 years. Did their life become better? In what way? Did it become worse? And actually, the results were quite shocking. Um, basically, the people felt that the transition was a total failure. There were only two positive things that they could see in the, this transition, and it was the freedom to travel. So basically, the, the freedom to leave the country. And uh, restitution. Then they were thinking that only 2% believed that the promise of rule of law was fulfilled. Only 5% believed that the promise of 
creating democratic institutions, functioning democratic institutions was fulfilled. Only 10% believe that the elections are free and fair. So from this perspective, from the perspective of this study, the transition was a total failure. Do you recognize some of these features also in Central Europe, in your country? Yes, I think I can respect and recognize these feelings and these facts, but beyond any doubt, there are also contradictory facts. Uh, for instance, if you look at Slovakia, uh, a country which was really a country lagging behind, which was the country where this concept of survival, it means somehow to accommodate to the ruling class, let it be in Vienna, in Budapest, in Moscow, in Prague, and now in Bratislava, for eastern part of Slovakia, and, and also experiencing, besides lagging behind, and besides this survivalist concept, uh, this phenomenon of catching out, catching up. So I don't think it's quite true. So this country uh, has reached uh, such a high percentage of European average of GDP, that it is quite remarkable. Uh, this country has, uh, and this is interesting, I think, phenomenon in my country, that we were definitely not the best pupils in the school, like the Czech Prime Minister Klaus used to say about the Czechs, that they are absolutely premiant, you know, they are, they are perfect. We didn't, we didn't think we are, and we were not. Actually, Slovakia already has experienced that type of rising of national populism, that type of decline of liberal values, what we see now in the West, sometimes for me is deja vu. To listen to Orban, to listen to Kaczynski, to listen to Le Pen, and to listen to many others, it's like if I were listening to Mechel in 1994, 1995, it's, it's almost the same expressions, the same mood, the same, uh, I would say, approach to this mentality of dissatisfied public. So. I think what, uh, what has helped us that we were practically almost excluded of this club of uh, new democracies. We were not invited into EU, we were not invited into NATO, and it looked like the Slovakia will be something like slightly more democratic, slightly more developed Belarus on, on the same. And then, then we came through this incredible period of raising of public awareness, gradually more and more people understood that this is not the way how we would like to live. This is not the way how, uh, how the governance should be performed. This is not the way uh, how we were dreaming and thinking in 1989. And gradually, uh, I would say the vital fight, vital struggle with this phenomenon of maturism, which, is, which includes everything besides this also populism and colonialism and so on and so on. So uh, there was a massive, massive civic uh, and very popular mobilization. We had 84% turnout and even young voters came and from this point of view, Mechel was defeated. Having this experience, and having also experience of Slovak national uprising against the fascists, there is something interesting. This is a society, this is a country which has certain capacity of self-learning. At the beginning, uh, people do not get it immediately. Even leaders do not get it immediately. When the Slovak state was established, people were not aware that it is practically a puppet state of, of Nazi Germany. Then when Nazis invited Poland, Slovakia, then Slovakia was the only country which joined the German military. So, you know, horrible experience. And, and only gradually they saw, not only, not only because of, uh, you know, liquidation of Jews, but, but also the way how the tradition functioned, that this is not it. And that after some period, after some years, we had this uprising. It was defeated by the Nazis, but anyway, it contributed to self-confidence. There were victims, a lot of them. Something similar has occurred during the period of Maturism, and I think this, with the tradition of First Czechoslovak Republic, it means that tra tradition, yes, mm, you know, corrupted, fragile, not very, very functioning, but still democracy during the First Czechoslovak Republic. 
uh, we are slightly, slightly better equipped also to cope with all those failures which you mentioned. And again, there are periods when we succeed. We had the first female prime minister in the Slovak history. It was quite successful. I mean, sometimes we, we fail, sometimes we have to cope. But, but by and large, uh, I would say, uh, there are open possibilities for citizens to mobilize, to, to act. And if now, for us, it is something very strange. If there are discussions of who should belong to this core of Europe, it looks like that even our pragmatic leader of our social democratic party somehow embraced this idea and wants to see Slovakia in this core, even if, in my understanding, the core is not only about uh, embracing some rules, but it's also about embracing some values, some political behavior and political culture and so on. So, I do not think it is a failure. What we see in Poland and Hungary, for example, we have experienced it. Uh, we do not see that those countries are lost. It's a tough period, very complicated period, maybe slightly more promising in Poland than in Hungary, but, but well, uh, it's not only up to them, it's also to our solidarity of member states of the Union and the others and, and the citizens for, for whom these principles, these ideas of freedom and liberty and democracy are sacred, simply to think of them, to help them and to become a part of, of, of the fight or of the struggle. At this moment, I would like to open this discussion to your questions, opinions, interventions. Uh, please give me a sign by raising your hand so that I know whom to give the microphone. Um, yes. ah. Thank you very much. I would like to ask a question about the situation in Slovakia today in particular with regard to what so, the so-called civil society. What is its situation today? Civil society, what we call NGOs. So we have the political parties, we have the political um, scene, and um, uh, but uh, nowadays uh, in the development of the post-communist countries, um, uh, the so-called civil societies uh, which raise the questions the politicians do not want to raise. For instance, the problem of growing inequality, uh, of uh, environmental destruction, etc., and which are also to a large degree neglected or only very superficially uh, dealt with in Brussels. Uh, so we, we need or uh, the, the civil society is um, more important, but I have not uh, um, and do not know very much what the situation of this civil society. I would like to mention the word Soros uh, as one of the main foundations uh, supporting this civil society, and where some politicians uh, or some governments in uh, the region uh, in the. Uh, post-communist countries are reacting very aggressively to. So, what is the situation in Slovakia? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a mixed picture at this time. Uh, we were fortunate to see the revitalization of civil society after 1989, and then in the period of ruling of Mecha, because uh, uh, it is an ironic effect that many people, many Democrats say that we should be grateful to him because we practically excluded a lot of people who were working and operating in various public or um, state institutions. And uh, so the gradually the third sector or NGO sector or independent sector, uh, I would say, um, uh, was, was given a strong incentive, strong support, and this tradition of that civic mobilization, because the elections were not only 
the achievement of parties and of media and of churches and of the trade unions at the time, 1998, but it was mainly uh, successful thanks to the, this vast public and civic mobilization. And this legacy has remained. The public campaigns were repeated during our accession to the European Union, and now we have a, a very diverse, I would say, plethora of uh, different organizations from, for instance, think tanks who are still producing a lot of alternative solutions, who are uh, commenting, uh, analyzing, criticizing any government, and they have, what is important, they have a voice. It's not just that they are just small academic institutions because media are giving the place to them. We have a lot of civic institutions which are overseeing the performance, especially, especially issues like corruption. And again, they also sometimes are able to develop the pressure. We have thousands of small civic initiatives which are uh, simply doing uh, inevitable, uh, inevitable roles and tasks and jobs in the countryside, in, in health care, in social care, and in everything similar. We have quite a lot of organizations which are coming with new ideas, uh, which are, I would say, the civic startups, uh, where this concept of civicness is, is cultivated, is, is learned, and is supported. And uh, I would say uh, this is something what is still present and what is still again, again, trying to influence, to have a voice also in public policies. On the other hand, at the same time, it's a, it's a challenge for many of those initiatives because it's not so easy to find not only support, but to find also financial support. There are grants from the state, but lowest in, from the all Visegrad countries. Fortunately enough, we do not have, uh, at this time, we do not have in the uh, in the ruling establishment, in the mainstream of political establishment, we do not have those, I would say, uh, uh, anti sholosh uh, furious attacks like like we saw, for instance, in 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 Hungary in the last speech of Prime Minister Orbán in July, so where he was talking about sholosh empire, and you know how it looked in Hungary when when you visited this country. So it means the organizations, uh, they cannot rely on Western support. There are some grants from the European Union, but, but in this period where people have problems uh, simply how to live, well, Bratislava is well, but you still have 20, 25% unemployment in some regions in Eastern Slovakia. We have the Roma settlements where Romas and non-Romas are simply experiencing mutual clashes and conflicts and so on. So in this situation where also this concept of individualism, individual carries, uh, was embraced, there is not always time and money to be involved in civil activities. But, but still, I can say that uh, this is a sector which is existing. I just one comparison. I remember when there was uh, political struggle between then Social Democratic Prime Minister Jurchan and, and um, uh, uh, Mr. Olbram from Fidesz. One Hungarian sociologist came to Bratislava and was talking about, about what are the perspectives of the next election. And he said, well, uh, the one of them has promised the, the, the 13th salary, and then came the other and he promised 14th salary. And I said, my God, and where are some civic authorities who would say, where are think tanks, where are independent circles who would have a voice and who would say, this is nonsense, they are lying both. And he said, well, uh, we have rather party-affiliated organizations in Hungary, unfortunately, so they are not, I would say, so visible and not so influential. I'm not saying it's idle in Slovakia, far from that, and there are there are repeated cases of massive corruption. There are, there are many, many disillusionments with a non-functioning judiciary, and I could go on and on, but look, a couple of weeks ago, 
Slovak parliament has finally abolished a shameful amnesties which were given by Mecha government to those to everyone who was involved in the kidnapping uh, abduction of the president's son and constitution court has approved it yes it took 20 years uh, after somehow even the ruling elites were able to understand that simply we cannot live like this and at least that smell of certain yes late justice the guy who was murdered at the time by Slovak secret service and by mafias simply his life will not be returned but it was also a certain incentive in the in this I would say moral pillars of society so basically a work in progress is the democratic development please um, I know that uh, Václav Havel in Czech, uh, that time Czechoslovakia, uh, he was very popular when he became president, but it seems after the fall of the wall and uh, after independence, uh, amongst, at least amongst the young people, he, he was no more so respected. Uh, how is it with the people from Slovakia, with, with the leaders, um, the signers of Charter 66 and so on? Well, I think in the first days and weeks and months, months uh, this circle around Charter 77 and around other civic initiatives which start to flourish at the end of 80s before the fall of regime in the, especially in the Czech part of the state. So those people, many of them entered politics and they were very active in the first parliament during those first two years and some of them continued uh, uh, simply to operate in, in the realm of politics. Yishi Dinsby, the new foreign minister in 1990, who was arrested for five years with Havel and many, many others, were uh, those people who helped to build the, the first basis of, of this uh, change regime. I think, as for the President Havel, uh, uh, it's an interesting story because once he has appeared in the territory of real politics, I'm not saying he has lost his, uh, his charisma or he has lost uh, everything what was surrounded at him, but he simply had to make some decisions. And if you are operating not as public intellectual, but as a politician, you have to make compromises, you have to select and it contributes to uh, somehow that the camp of your, of your opponents and enemies is on the rise. There were, I think, two strong figures on the Czech political scene, and we can, we can illustrate it on the two concepts of how the society should work by Václav Klaus and Václav Havel. Václav Klaus says that, well, all these NGOs, this NGOism and the human rightism and, and genderism and so on, who are the people? They are not elected. What we need is a normal political parties. People should be elected and only representative democracy is uh, the clue, the key to the future development. Havel, on the other side, was a fan of civic participation. So he said these civic activities are important. And I think this legacy is still existing in the Czech Republic. And uh, Havel became, I think, even more popular after he ceased to be the president because Czechs gradually discovered uh, you know, how, how important and how substantial his voice is. And, and when he passed, uh, this aura around him, I think, has even increased. And it's not by chance that in the current discussions, current fights and current struggles, those so-called Havloists or so-called Sunnishkajis, it means sunny people, are, are associated with, uh, with uh, 
the figure of Václav Havel. I think he was absolutely unique because uh, he embodied at the end of the 80s both, both types of dissent. It was first of all the reflective dissent, he was writing about it, discussing and so on, but also active dissent, he was very active. And uh, perhaps one of his legacies, one of his very strong and still present, uh, still present memory is uh, what he was writing about the concept of the hope. I will say that hope, it is not something what is the sort of forecasting. Hope is an orientation of our heart and if, if we are proceeding in accordance with the hope, it doesn't mean that, that we are convinced or that we know that we will win. Uh, but uh, it is important to preserve this orientation regardless what the results will be. And I think this message, this uh, this reference is valid not only for the Czechs or Slovaks, but it has and still has, it had and still has the resonance worldwide. Um, I, I want to ask you to say a bit more about um, you said that listening to Kaczynski and Orban today and Le Pen, you're reminded of Mechiar in 1994. And I'm also reminded of Mechiar in 1994. That's something I've been thinking a lot about because I remember being in Bratislava in 1994. And there was a feeling that people had then that, well, this is a, it's a new democracy, it's a new country, it's very fragile, it doesn't have this history of democratic liberalism. The lesson is that it's not very easy to transition, it's not very easy to create a liberal democratic culture, so naturally it's going to be difficult, and then Mechiar seemed to keep coming back, and he'd go away, and he'd come back, and he'd go away, and he'd come back, and then finally he was overcome. And, and now we're seeing something where, you know, in places like Poland and Hungary, where it seemed like, like some kind of democratic liberalism or liberal democracy had managed to come out of 1989. Now, to say nothing of France and to say nothing of, of my own country, where we're watching the collapse of liberal democracy. And now we're seeing places where you can't say, well, they've never had liberal democracy, they don't understand how it works. Now we're watching the fragility of liberalism, you know, in places where it's already been established, you know. And, I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about whether the, the fragility of liberalism that you experienced under Mechiar and the fragility of liberalism you're watching now um, are coming from similar sources, are coming from different sources. Is there something that the rest of us can, can learn or draw from the experience of Mechiar and the fact that finally in the end he goes away? Yes, it's, to a certain extent it's also a comment. Okay. So the fragility of liberalism and whether there is a lesson to be drawn from the Slovakian mm -hmm. case of me. Yeah. Fragility that you witnessed. Well, I think the a certain modest lesson from Slovakia simply is that uh, um, there is also hope that this uh, trend illiberal trend can be overcome. It just needs the really involvement of, of uh, people coming from various environments, from various, let's say, territories, if I may. Uh, it, uh, on the one hand, may be as, compli it's as complicated as it was in Slovakia. Even if it is different in its mode and in, in, in its taste, in its performance. Uh, in case of Mecha, he successfully grasped uh, the rising dissatisfaction with uh, 
bad functioning economy with rising unemployment, uh, with uh, this perception that against there are there is someone else, there are others who are not uh, allowing Slovakia to prosper. At that time, it was Czechs and the Hungarians, and he did it. Uh, I would say. Uh, relatively quickly, successfully, and he created a regime uh, which at that time was, I would say, even in its beginnings, quite detailed, described, analyzed, named and labeled. It was this maturism with, with all these qualifications. I think in case of Hungary and Poland, to a certain extent, the politicians on that side of political spectrum are somehow coming and restoring also old national myths. They are coming rather to the concept of a nation than a concept of a state. If you, if you look, if you read, if you watch, if you follow uh, the various speeches, various comments, various articles by both of those politicians. So you you see as if there was something more behind it. Mecha was a root autocrat uh, who simply was closely attached to this power, to this power feelings, and sometimes was evidently behaving in a problematic way, not by chance, the Slovak psychiatrist wrote a public statement of the whole association of Slovak psychiatrists that this is a man with so high psychopathic features that he should leave the public space. In case of those two leading politicians, I think there is the whole story behind them. Uh, uh, it's a, in case of Poland, this is a story that, yes, we are the civilization which was standing, uh, and to certain extent similar to Hungarians, which were standing on the frontiers of the West. We are Christians, we have been uh, defending this broader Western Christian community, and, and these new regimes, these liberal democracies, this European federalism, this uh, multiculturalism, and many, many other phenomena are threatening this what was the core basis of, of, of our nation. Then there is, I'm afraid, a certain type, certain features of a certain doctrine. We have Robert Fizzo, who is a social democrat by name. I don't think he is very genuine or he's a typical social democrat because if you look at, I don't know, uh, Scandinavian social democrats, so Fizzo's party is not not exactly the same, but he's rather a pragmatist. Uh, he doesn't have any special doctrine. He doesn't dreaming about restoring of the great Moravian state or something like that. I'm afraid in case of doctrine, there is, there is not only the cultural unity of the Hungarians living in Hungary and abroad, but also a sort of political unity. And then, uh, both of them have their own vision, that, which is even similar to that phenomenon of Russia, that we are, we are those, we are the messengers of, of this civilization. We can save it, we can show them how it should work, and, uh, and all those who are criticizing us, they are not the genuine patriots, and they are just doing it in service of Brussels and so on. Last sentence of... of um, of uh, Orban in this speech when he, you know, criticized European Union and criticized Brussels and so on and so on. He said, 27 years ago, here in Central Europe, we believed that Europe was our future. Today, we feel that we are the future of Europe. I'm afraid it's too much to think that exactly Orban's type of democracy is the future of Europe, but uh, but I'm afraid it's not just a cynical slogan. There is some interiorized conviction that yes, we are those, you know, who were, who were 
commissioned, who were called, who were selected to defend that type of values. So, from this point of view, it, it, it uh, might be even more complicated, but if you look at Poland with its tradition of you know, civic involvement, its tradition of many, many independent areas from us, from, from solidarity and so on, so I think there, there, there are billion endowed routes for a change. And, and I, as for Hungarians or Magyars, I, I don't know if you know this play uh, about the Todd family from Istvan Erke. This is a famous picture of people who are simply experiencing a humiliation and suppression and, and so on and so on. And then, at one point of time, there is an outburst. And they simply do what they do in this play by Istvan Erkeny. I think there is such an element, there is a certain Hungarian proudness which, which might emerge. Obviously, it will need also some some organization or mobilization, it won't be that easy to overcome those roadblocks and barriers which were created uh, and limitations which were created by these regimes, but it's still there. The final sentence, we were lucky, we were happy in public against violence, that from the very beginning we were joined by li young liberal Hungarians. They were better educated than us. Uh, Budapest was already open, there was a rebarrier of Imrenac, so they got all the ideas from there, and they helped us somehow to develop, to cultivate, to nurture this liberal narrative. So we were happy to co communicate and cooperate with them, and, and thank this spirit of devotion to those deeply anchored values is also present in Hungary, sooner or later it will emerge. This was a beautiful end to our talk. Uh, thank you very much, Martin Butura, for sharing with us your experiences about the Velvet Revolution that you lived through. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're continuing in half an hour in four venues. You have the programs. Thank you. <laughs>